Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, we're just starting the stream now, so uh, welcome back. We're with Bob the Father again uh, for this the tenth day of August, twenty twenty one. So, also happy feast day to all of our deacons out there, transitional or permanent, as it's the feast of Saint Lawrence and a great martyr with a great sense of humor. So. Um, as out of did my senior talk about this morning about St. Lawrence a lot or did he say anything uh, about him? I mean he didn't mention it. He didn't, you know, that he was so um, you know, the poor and yeah. you know, doing yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing of humor. Well it's a great well it's a great story actually. Like um so on Saturday, which was what the eighth of August eighth? No, seventh of August, um, we celebrated Pope Sixtus the second. Yeah. And Sixtus uh, was um, found in, uh, he was actually, you know, he was a bishop, uh, pope actually, and uh, he was in um, a cemetery to celebrate Mass. And Valerian's guards, the, the emperor's guards, came and picked him up after, I guess it was after Mass, I'm not sure if it was during Mass or after Mass, but they brought him back to uh, the emperor along with four other deacons, and, um, well actually, yeah, four other deacons. And um, they decide to execute Sixtus II with three of the deacons. But one of the deacons, they, the, the uh, emperor said, well, I want you to go and gather all the riches of the church and bring them to me. Um, and otherwise, we'll, we'll, we're going to have to put you to death. And so uh, that deacon, of course, was Lawrence. And so Lawrence said uh, to the emperor, well, um, you know, give me, give me three days to go and gather all, you know, all the treasures and I'll, I'll bring them to you. So uh, he took the three days and went throughout all of Rome, gathering the sick and the lame and the suffering and the poor. And he gathered them all in the court of the emperor and then presented them to the emperor. You asked for all the riches of the church, and here they are. Well, of course, Valerian was not very happy with that, and so he ended up executing Lawrence. And as legend has it, uh, he was put on a grill and roasted alive. Um, as, and as he was being roasted on one side, he famously, whether it's a true or not, said, uh, I'm done on this side, flip me over. So <laughs> I think as it shows the joviality, joviality of um, the, the Lawrence himself, but also maybe uh, there's a saintly uh, aspect of that thing for us all, that we tend to look at things in the world and take them so seriously when ultimately a lot of these things don't matter as much. Um, but also I think that gives us, uh, the intercession of St. Lawrence kind of gives us some pause to kind of reflect on our own lives and see where the Lord is present in, in that. Um, so also the, the, the fact that the deacons at the time, um, for the first maybe 500 years of the church, they actually had more of a, I want to say a secular role. Um, there was a question that was asked me this past week from one of our teachers at the school about the diaconate, and uh, the teacher taking this class on the sacraments, and the question that was posed to him was, um, "What is the reestablishment of the permanent diaconate, diaconate had on your parish? What, how, what impacts that had in your parish?" Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting. A lot of people don't realize that the permanent diaconate it kind of went into um, disarray between about no, the seventh century, well, and up until about Vatican II. So. The permanent diaconate was not really something that was, it was, it was always a part of the church, but it wasn't necessarily something you had a lot of people involved with for about a thousand years or so. Um, I think people, some people are kind of shocked that, you know, the permanent diaconate, like here in St. Louis, we didn't have permanent deacons ordained until the 1970s. So from the founding of St. Louis all the way until after Vatican II, there was no permanent deacons in St. Louis. Now other cultures and communities tend to like maybe kind of uh, champion it and kind of ma ma maintain it, um, but like places like Africa, South America, a lot of places in Western Europe, in the term deacons were not really a thing. Um, and there's different reasons, different people have posited why that happened. Some people think that uh, because of the New York Church, the permanent diaconate was really more directed towards like more the secular or like you know the, the practical aspects of the church. So. They would run these dicasteries or these ministries. They'd be kind of the heading them up, and there was a question raised: Well, wait a minute. Uh, in the hierarchy of the church, how does a deacon have more authority than like a priest or a bishop? Mm -hmm. Because some of these organizations, the deacon would be the head, and then you'd have priests and even bishops sometimes under right. those those heads. 
And so it didn't really make sense from an ecclesiastical or from a hierarchical standpoint. Um, now there's ways you can get around that and say, well, yeah, there's really not a technically a hierarchical authority, but they are just responsible for like a steward of those ministries, uh, which I think is some of the answers we, we have today. But uh, back then it was looked on as like, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. And so then you started seeing a lot more deacons kind of fall away, uh, not necessarily fall away from their, they maintain but like replaced with like somewhat of higher authority in the hierarchical church. Um, others just say that it became kind of a practice that was not really necessary anymore. I mean, um, the diaconate was kind of looked at as a stage of development for holy orders. I mean, of course, the deacon is an ordained man. They receive the gift, they receive the sacrament of holy orders. But that was almost considered like a stepping stone to the priesthood. And it was, um, but uh, there's always been kind of two of those forms of the permanent and trench diaconate, but the trench is tending precedence. Um, back in the Middle Ages, all the way through, well, Vatican II for the most part. So, kind of interesting thing. Um, yeah. So. So deacons, they can baptize. They can marry. Uh, yeah. They can, you know, of course, administer the the, uh, the communion. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Liturgically speaking. Um, Gosh. Their primary responsibility is to uh, baptize Mary and Barry. So they can they can be the minister at a funeral service without a mass, right? They can still do all the rites of a funeral um, without consecrating the Eucharist. Um, baptizing, but then again, also technically anyone can baptize, but they are the or, they are the ordinary minister of baptism. Um, one of the ordinary ministers, ministers of baptism, along with priests and bishops. Um, they're also uh, tech. Typically, they have a faculty of preaching, which means they could give a homily. Um, as a matter of fact, what's, what's interesting about that is uh, many deacons who were ordained after 1970 to Vatican II, here at least here in St. Louis, did not have that faculty when they were ordained to actually preach. Hmm. So they had to go back and take another class before they were given that faculty. And even then, it was at the discretion of the, the pastor whether that can be granted or not. Um, Excuse me. Since 2018, though, every deacon that's been ordained, which has only been maybe 30 of them, yeah, maybe close to 40, um, they've already they've been given that faculty at their ordination. So they, they've reformed the structure of the formation, and now every deacon that's ordained now has that faculty. But still, the pastor has to give that authority. So it's like a priest. Um, you know, a priest has the capacity to do these things. As a deacon has the capacity to do all these things, a baptism, a marriage, whatever. Um, but they have to be given that faculty by the bishop, and when it comes to preaching, the pastor has uh, discretion on that. Um, whereas, same with the priest, like the priest has the capacity to actually separate the mass and to hear confessions, but that that uh, that authority, that that faculty, has to be given by the bishop. So when we talk about, I think we talk about this before. When we talk about the lay laicization, laicization, right? So someone becomes, um, well. Like a better word, back to a lay state. Um, even a deacon or priest still has the capacity of that. So you don't you don't lose that that character of the priest or the diaconate. You're you're a deacon and a priest forever. Hmm. But the actual practice um, those ministries, that's what you lose lose in lay station. The bishop is taking that back there away from you, right? And only in special occasions by law can you actually do it. Like basically, it's on the point of death. So if someone were dying and you were, let's say, a laicized priest, you could still grant them absolution and do all the last rites and all that kind of stuff, but only in that particular scenario. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, same with the deacon. I mean, they could baptize somebody over the point of death, but so could anybody. Yeah. So yeah, good. A little confused, Walt. Do you have a question on that, or mm -hmm. you'll kind of like you're like, hmm, I don't know. I'm, I'm taking it all in. All right, great, very good. All right. Well, good. Any other questions? Anyone online? We got so we got four people watching, which is great. Um, oh, hello. Yeah, someone said hello. hello. Um, what do we got? Anyone? Open forum. I'm here to learn. <laughs> Us converts have to suck it in somehow. I hear ya. I hear ya. Let me turn off my email to make sure it doesn't beep the entire time. We all have to learn. That we all. That same for me. Same for me too. So. All right. So, any questions at all? Please, is open. Anyone online? If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I'll be reading them on the comment section. So, 
any topic whatsoever. The Big Bang popcorn. <laughs> it's, not, it's not Friends in Faith, it's Father the Father. You know, the I think about it. I brought it last week, it was brand new, I opened it. I haven't eaten out of it since last week. <laughs> Well, um, maybe on some more parochial news, uh, we um, our youth minister dropped by today to look at her office. So, okay, she'll be taking up residence there where the um, um, youth what do we, we call it the uh, children's liturgy okay. would be held. Um, we're thinking probably moving them into the uh, crafters room on Sunday if they. But then again, they can still use that room probably too as long as they don't touch anything. <laughs> yeah, problem that. Uh, <laughs> so uh so it's good that she's now involved and she's you know she started on the first of uh of august so she's gonna be here part-time helping out and hopefully that could change that could move into something bigger which we really hope it will, it will. um so yeah that's awesome and the, what's her background is she uh, so primarily teaching so she taught at like saint simon and also at margaret of scotland um as well as uh she get her. I think she got her CRE certification too. So she's got a lot of good credentials. Uh -huh. um, she's got two daughters, twin daughters in the school, and a young one, a little, little guy. Um, so yeah, looking forward to having her and be part of the team. So it's gonna be great. Uh, otherwise, the teachers are back this week, so they're all they're all kind of back. Uh, <laughs> Yes, yes, that's, that is Walt with his popcorn. Yes, that's true. I guess you hear you eating the popcorn in the microphone. <laughs> they know that. That was an easy question. All right. Oh, here we go. Um, wow, okay. How do we know what God wants us to do, and how do we know if it is him that we believe we are hearing? Yeah, so a lot of this comes down to, uh, we have a term for this in spiritual life called discernment of spirits. And, um, you know, and for the most part, there's different spiritual schools out there, like, like Carmelite, Franciscan, Dominican, Jesuit. Um, and they all kind of follow the same kind of rule, for the most part, when it comes to discernment. And discernment, of course, means it's a choice between two goods, right? That's much different than, like, a moral decision, right? Moral decision is very clear. There's a very clear one we shouldn't do. And it's a very clear one that we should do. And that's based on our conscience and how well it's formed, right? So we're formed in like the commit Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes and the teaching of Jesus Christ and his church to understand, yeah, this morally is not right and this morally would be right, right? So robbing a bank, yeah, that's not a good thing to do. I don't want to do that because that money is not mine and there's a reason why we, we should treat others the way we want to be treated. And so therefore I should not steal something, take something that does not belong to me, right? Because I don't want that happen to me. Um, killing. Well, I shouldn't kill someone because obviously I don't want to, someone to kill me. That's not really justice or even you know good or charitable. Um, so therefore, I will not kill anyone else. But also just because it's not good to take something sacred and profane it, right? So it goes along with like you know even our sacraments and other things like that. That's different than a discernment. And discernment is you're you're trying to ask a God what He wants you to do in your life, right? So. We think of the sermon as kind of this with this big D, meaning like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do with the rest of my life? Like, should I get married, or should I become a priest or sister, or a nun or a monk, or a brother or sister, or should I maybe try to dedicate my life to some sort of service, or um, maybe take profess vows in some way, maybe not necessarily with an order, but like as a, like consecrated virgin, or um, what the Lord's calling you to do in like your your life for like that leads to eternity, like to get closer to him, to actually find happiness in this life. That's what we call like big D discernment. And some of that also includes like, what should I do as a, for, for a living? Like what's, what do you call me to do to use the talents you've given me to actually help others and serve my brothers and sisters? That's all kind of uh, forms of big D discernment. But within that, there's these little D discernments that kind of lead to that, right? So, well, what school should I go to? Or um, who should I take as like, who should I, who, what friends should I really hang out with? Or what even what, what news outlet should I listen to, right? These are all kind of forms of discernment, and it really all should be directed towards what God wants for you in your life. Um, so the question at hand is, well, how do we, when we do that, let's say we ask God, hey, Lord, what do you want me to do in this scenario? How do we know that it's God speaking to us and not something else or someone else? Well, I think the best form, at least the ones I've, I've probably been most schooled in, 
And again, there's other ways of looking at this, but they all kind of are similar in this, in this fact. Um, Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, he made up these rules of discernment, you know. And part of this leads into like, you know, a 30-day retreat that all Jesuits have to take and um, kind of the, the, the uh, discernment of spirits that, that most Jesuits are schooled in. And we're schooled in pretty well at the seminary too. Um, it comes down to kind of three basic rules when it comes to like where, who, sh how do we know what, what's coming to us actually from God? Um, and it's really kind of simple when you think about it, it kind of just breaks down to this, that if the thought of achieving this goal, of doing this that I'm thinking about, so let's say it's, let's say it's school choice. Let's say, okay, Lord, I've gotten into Notre Dame and I've gotten into Rolla. Um, what do you want me to do? Okay, well, if I went to Notre Dame, is there a sense of peace, joy, happiness in that, right? If the answer to that is yes, and that's from God, right? Okay, well, let's say there's a lot of fear because, oh, that's far away from home, and um, there's a lot of anxiety because I don't know anyone there, and uh, I'm not sure if that's really the best place for me. Um, if there's a sense of fear or anger or anxiety, that's typically from the evil one. Right. And then if there's a sense of like ambiguity, like I just don't know, Lord, that's usually from you, right? So that's kind of how we when we say discernment of spirits. That's kind of what we're looking at. Okay, the thought, the end goal of achieving this, whether it be going to this school instead of this school, or maybe like you know choosing this person as my spouse instead of this person, or um, if it's become, become part of religious life, or even like maybe going to the archdiocese and rather than the priesthood, whatever it may be. That's where we're supposed to kind of be asking ourselves in that prayer and asking the Lord is what, how, how would I feel? What would I? How can I imagine myself in this position? And what kind of feelings do I get from that? Right? What kind of thoughts come to my mind? Is there is there these these feelings, these thoughts of of goodness and you know happiness and joy, or is there still some anxiety and some frustration and maybe some fear? Um, do they both really seem like good options? I just don't really know. I mean, I could probably fit in fine with both, and I'm not really sure. Well, that's probably more you. And so what uh, what initially it would say in those circumstances where there's ambiguity, you shouldn't do anything until the, the, until the actual um, resolution presents itself in some way. And that should be done through prayer, um, discussing with other people, people you, you trust. Um, Looking for subtle signs in your life that may be pointing this one way or another, right? Sometimes it'd be as simple as some of the bumper sticker drives by and it's like, mm -hmm. oh wow, that's interesting, right? So it's something that kind of just sticks out to you. It's being attentive to those moments in your life is kind of the Lord speaking to you in those ways. So prayer obviously should be should be fundamental, but also the people in your life that you trust should also be a good source. Um, and also just trusting your instinct, your conflict, like the Lord speaking through you too. Um, so that's kind of how we would say we want to. Um, discern between who is actually speaking to us in these moments uh, when it comes to these happy decisions. So in some ways it's kind of a calculus, right? It's like, well, you know, I see myself better here than I do here, but you know, maybe it's like a choice between like four or five different things. Well, again, it's kind of the same same process, but where do I feel the most joy, peace, happiness, you know, compared to the other ones? So I hope that answers the question. Um, that's kind of what we talk about when, we, when we're thinking about discernment is how do we tell what's coming from God, what's not coming from God. Will that make sense? Maybe, hopefully. I don't know. Let's see if anyone would respond. All right. Seems like you're drawn to something, you know, when you're trying to decide. Yeah. You're drawn a little bit more. Right. This. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because I think as like more younger, I don't know about most people, I guess we speak for ourselves, like when I was younger, I didn't really ask God a lot of times like what he wanted from me. It just kind of like felt like we well, went with the flow. Like, okay, if something presents itself, maybe that could be an opportunity, maybe not. And that, but part of like the way that what it works, but that's still God working in your life in some way. It's just you're not attentive to it. And a lot of that depends on spiritual maturity because, you know, as children, we're not spiritually mature, just like we're not physically mature. We tend to just do what our parents tell us, which is great, it's good, because your parents should, you know, direct you in a good way. Um, but we get to a certain age where it's like, well, what do I want to do? Who am I as a person? Um, and then we start asking those deeper questions like, God, what do you want from me? But that even takes me some time too before we get there. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes I think there's a, 
a development just as a maturity in the physical life and the spiritual life that you know sometimes we want to focus on ourselves when we're younger like how am I going to make the money how am I going to you know who am I going to have my girlfriend or my boyfriend or whatever and we're not necessarily asking God what he wants in our lives so um, yeah it's a process it's a process okay let's see the, so follow looks like what if I feel drawn to a decision yet logically I can't see that it would be a good decision he has always been there for me, and so maybe he wants me to take a big leap of faith. And I'm only, I'm only on a need to know basis. Yeah, that could be. You know, sometimes, a lot of times, um, our choices aren't necessarily logical. Um, when it comes, it depends on what perspective. In the eyes of the world, maybe it doesn't seem logical, but in the eyes of faith, it may seem perfectly reasonable. So um, again, I can only speak for myself, but when I was discerning becoming a priest. It started not really like as a big like monumental, you know, overcoming of me to say, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to be doing this. It started subtly, and when it got to the point where I understood that like, okay, I need to at least go try this and see if this works. Because um, the logic there is, well, if it doesn't work, then at least I know it doesn't work, and so I know that's not where God's calling me. Um, but if you looked at what, what my actions. <laughs> in the eyes of the world, I was having a, I had a six-figure job, I had a great, like a pretty comfortable life, um, in the eyes of the world, I was successful, and I said, I don't need it, or I should say the Lord told me I don't need it, and so I trusted in that, and followed what he was calling me to do, and it worked out. And part of that, I think, is what you what you rightly say is is a trust in Him, that you have to trust that He knows better than you do what you need and what you want. And for me, that's how it panned out. And I think most people who look back on their lives and, and discern and look in their, in their like where God was present, they come to that realization that yeah, you know, this didn't make sense at the time what I was doing. This didn't make sense at the time that I started maybe dating this person. This makes sense at the time when I actually maybe went to this school or took this class or you know. But God was present there and led me to something bigger. Um, I think that if you if you really look back in your life and self reflect, I think you find that those moments are are huge in hindsight. But in the moment, they seem just crazy and weird. Mm -hmm. I think that's just kind of how you have to trust in Him that He's gonna He's gonna have it work out for you. But I think the key is if you still feel that sense of joy, peace, and happiness, then that's all you really need to know. Right, and as long as you have that, the rest will pan out. Now, that, that's, that, that's not to say it's going to be you know unicorns and rainbows and puppy dogs and the process to get there, but it's not about the process of getting there. The means of getting there, we expect what we call spiritual warfare in those processes, because if you're truly doing what God wants you to do, the evil one doesn't want you to do that. So of course he's going to put out roadblocks to you to keep you from doing that. And his hope in that is that you would run in those roadblocks and just stop and then return back. Right? He wants you to do what he wants you to do. Um, so, of course, we would expect these, these obstacles in our way. But we also understand that if we truly are following our vocation or doing true discernment, that God's going to help us persevere through those roadblocks or avoid them or, you know, jump over them or whatever, you know, whatever the analogy you want to take. Um, because he, he wants that to happen for us. And he does not abandon us. And so there's a logic in that, right? There's a logic in that, that, okay, I'm guided by this principle that I call God, that he's directing me, he, what, he loves me, wants the best things for me, he's going to help me and give me the grace to overcome these things. So even if there's obstacles in the way, it's okay, because God's still going to bring me through. Um, I think that's a logical argument. Now, of course, that's a theological argument, not necessarily a philosophical or a scientific one, but there, that's why we have to, when we talk about these logic, we also have to put it in the proper context of in what aspect. Because scientific logic is different than philosophical logic, which is different than theological logic. They're all truth, they all direct towards truth, but some are higher levels than others. Mm -hmm. And so we always have to put it in the proper context. So yeah, I think if you're, if you're saying that, um, if you're saying logically, I, I think I'd ask, well, what, in what context do you mean logically? Do you mean in like in, in a practical way? Do you mean in a scientific way? Do you mean in a philosophical way? 
being a theological way. So because, they, yeah, the, the sermons are different for each one of those, of those aspects. Um, but if you're saying from a theological way, which is the highest order, you can't help but win when you're following what God wants you to do. And there's a logic to that, because I'm saying that's not me that's really wanting this as God, and my will conforms to his, right? So therefore, he will not let me fail. Does that make sense? Talk about the spiritual life, it's always kind of fun. There's a great book, uh, Discernment of Spirits, by, oh boy, I always forget his name. He's a good. He's a great author, though. I've, I've heard him like three times too. And it's, he's really, really, really good. Um, boy, I want to look it up someday. But Sermon of Spirits, and he's an oblate of Mary. He's a really great guy. Oh, man, I'm just gonna kick myself when it comes to me. But yeah, that's a great book. So I, I would encourage anyone to go and um, um, check out that book if, if you really want to know more about Sermon of Spirits discernment in, in the proper sense. Uh, Sitting down with pen and paper, and there's no way this can possibly work. I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay, great. Questions, comments, concerns, heresies? <laughs> You've been talking great big discernments. Well, I think it, I think it applies to what, no matter what discernment you're talking about. I think, you know, when we talk about discernment, we're talking about, again, it's always a choice between two good. So you can even say that's like a decision, right? So like, oh, hey, you know, okay, uh, maybe a great example of that would be um, my parents are trying to look for a house. They moved out of their house of 39 years back in, in January. And I think there, there was not a lot of discernment. I love them deeply, don't get me wrong, I love them, but I don't think there was a lot of discernment involved in the decision they made. And I think they had a plan, which isn't bad, um, but they discerned, or at least they, they made the decision that when the price they were given for their, their house of 39 years was too good to pass up. So they were going to go live with my sister for a couple months, find a house in the meantime, then move in, everything's gonna be hunky-dory. Well, of course, what happens? Well, the market bottoms out, the market just explodes. Yeah. And so they can't find a place to do within their price range or stuff they, or, the, or the house they really would want within their price range, it actually has everything they want. So instead of being a two month, you know, processing with my sister, now it's turned into nine months, right? Or, you know, going on, going on nine. Um, Maybe forever. <laughs> Maybe. And so uh, it's one of these things where it's like, well, did you ever really stop to ask God what he wanted for you in this one, in these, in these aspects, right? Because sometimes our practicality can can't take over us, like, it just makes sense. This makes, this makes logical sense. This should work. Oh yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Tim, Tim, uh, Father Tim Gallagher, thank you, yes. The sermon is created by Father Tim Gallagher, yes, okay, thanks. Um, so, yeah, if, if someone, but, I mean, logically speaking, you're thinking just from a like, practical standpoint, yeah, that makes sense, you're gonna go sell it, you got a good price, sell your house, you can use part of that money to buy a new one, right? That something you're gonna, you're gonna kind of pare down because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're empty nesters. You want someone in one story, that should be cheaper than what you're paying with now. Sure, that makes sense. But then, okay, and now where are we are, right? Um, so the question would be, would remain, did you ever ask God what he wanted for you at this moment? Maybe they did. I don't know. I mean, I, I, the, the, my discussion with them didn't seem like they were asking God too much about it. A lot of the prayer came after the fact, like, okay, okay, we have to start praying now that I actually find a place. They found a good place. Well, okay, well, all right, well, the, the ship has already sailed in that respect, right? So this should have started beforehand when it comes to the discernment process. Um, so yeah, but I think any decision we make in life is really discernment, um, because we always our choices are always between goods. Even in a, somebody would argue, some uh, moral theologian would say that even in, in a moral choice is always a perception of good, right? So in other words, why do we sin? Well, we sin because we perceive a good in what we're doing. Now the problem with that is we may not understand or be able to recognize the hierarchy of those goods, right? In other words, we put a more base good in ahead of a higher good. So in other words, let's say, um, yeah, you know what? Uh, to have money is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing we have money so I can support my family and my, you know, my, my people, um, right? Which level? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. Um, so yeah, so in, other, so in that case, if that's my intention, then I'm not gonna make this seem that big of a deal. 
Okay. There's money, I need money, so therefore I'm gonna rob money. But the problem is what you're, what you're taking out of that is, well, that's not your money, right? That isn't something that you worked for and earned. It's Caesar's. Right, yeah, right. It's something that, that is, it's, it doesn't, it's, yeah, there's a hierarchy of that good to recognize that I'm a human person, they're human people. There's something that's given to them because they work hard and given to me that work hard. And therefore I don't have the right in justice or, or in charity to take something that doesn't belong to me. So in other words, they're trumping the good of money above that of charity and justice. And that's where the sin lies. You're saying this is a higher thing than these other things. Right? That's where a conscious starts pinging. It's like, eh, wait, wait a minute, you're, you're out of order there, right? You know, that's, 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 that's not in line with prudence or justice or wisdom or any other virtues that were given by the Holy Spirit. So that's not good for you to do. Yeah, money's fine, but you, you have to go find another way of doing that, right? So, same thing in discernment, but the difference in discernment, they're equally good, right? So, to get education is a good thing. Now, whether you get an education over here or over here, well, it's an education, and there's going to be goods that come from that no matter what. But if I'm going to a school that champions, I don't know, veterinary you know, sciences, but I want to be a poet, well, <laughs> okay, well, maybe that wouldn't be so great, you know? All yeah, right, I don't know. Um, so it's, there's, that's what we're talking about discernment. It's really a choice between those goods and what's how are you using the gifts that God gives you for the, your own good and for the good of others. Right. Sometimes I think sometimes I think that in my life I've just kind of gone on because you know I have family. I knew I had these, this, this, and this, this, and this, and this, and this yeah. to do to keep everybody where they're supposed to be and keep them all yeah. old and educated and whatnot. And, yeah. You just you know, you just don't even think about discerning. Well, well sure. Just, and I think I think in those aspects like when you're when you have children, yeah. you definitely as a parent you definitely have to say in that, right? You should. Yeah. Um, the child is not, even the teenagers, sorry teenagers, they're not mentally developed enough to make these calls. Right? They don't have that maturity level yet. You can even argue people in their twenties don't necessarily have that maturity level yet. Right? Um well, I mean, even science shows that the, the frontal lobe doesn't necessarily develop until you're about 26 years old, like fully developed, right? So, I shouldn't have got married at 22. Then. I mean, there's <laughs> arguments about that sometimes. Like, people <laughs> talk about when it comes to uh, annulments, that's that's a valid reason. Well, we weren't mature enough. Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's important to recognize those those relationships that, yeah, as a mother or as a father, somebody to make that call for your child, and that's fine. That's probably okay. Now... In the same way, though, mother, child, mother and father should be asking God what he wants for their children. So, yeah. And I don't know how often that happens either. Yeah. You know. I know the reason I went to CBC is because my uncles went to CBC. That was really it. And I did feel good. I, did, I felt more at home in CBC than probably the other place I visited. But, you know, was there a better school for me out there? I don't know. I mean, I think I did okay. Um, but maybe I've been better off going to, like, Miani or... St. Mary's or schools, I think, are you know you get out of them what you put into them. That's very true. That's very you know? true. And I, I didn't. There you go. And I will say I didn't realize that until I got to college, because what I realized when I got to college was everyone there was from different backgrounds, different mm -hmm. schools, and they're all there because they deserve to be there and they put the time and their energy into their studies to get there. Right. And it was even more a deeper understanding was when how many people got retained after the first year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Rala has a notorious uh, attrition rate that about half the class has gone by the first semester. And about in the second semester, about 35% of that is gone. Kind of like the College of Pharmacy. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, the same thing. I think we'll figure out really quick if they're being called to be a, an engineer or not when they go to they have a WAM class. Yeah. yeah. So it's, but yeah, I mean, part of that's done for you, but also, yeah, I think everyone there deserves to be there. Now, Staying there, well, that's a different story because you have to work at it too. And you're going to put it, you're going to get out what you put into it as well. Um, but even then, I, you know, sometimes we can ask, well, was it really a good discernment to go to Rala if you only lasted a semester? <laughs> you know, I, I know. made it two years. That's good. Hey, you're better than most. Better than most. They say, I think after after your junior year is pretty much settled. If you can make your junior year pretty much in, you're good to go. At least that's what, that's what you say when I went there. But who knows, things change. So. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, discernment is always something we should be. We always really do it whether we, we know it or not. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes, you don't necessarily ask God what He wants in these things. No. Shoot, I didn't even ask. I a little discernment that I have. I love doing those wedding things. Yeah. And I guess that was kind of a discernment that I wasn't even. It makes me feel real good. Yeah. And the people thank me profusely. Yeah. yeah. So. But I think I think it goes I really to, like it. I think it goes to show though, Walt, that like that's God still working in your life, even if you're not aware of it. Yeah. So even though you don't necessarily ask God what He wants, well, God's still going to direct you in some ways. Yeah. Right. One person asked me to help him out. Yeah. And I'm going to do this. <laughs> yeah. I, and I think in the same way, like. I think it comes, it comes when it comes to ministry. I think you, you definitely would be correct in that. I, I think most people are asked to be like catechists or Eucharistic ministers or lectors, or whatever. I don't know if they really discern it very much. I think a lot of times the decision comes down to, well, Father asked me, so I think I probably should. I, I think kind of the same way as when men are asked to be like bishops, right? Because sometimes the logic is, well, I've been ordained to serve, I'm, I pledge obedience, um, and. I guess I should be a bishop because the Holy Father asked me to. Well, that's not necessarily good discernment. <laughs> I mean, I mean it's, you, can, you can trust the Holy Father as God by the Holy Spirit to ask you for a good reason. That could be a factor. But I don't know if that should be the only factor of saying yes to that, right? Part of that should be taking a prayer and reflection and, and you know, meditation and say, Lord, you want this for me. So it was somebody else's discernment. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in a way you could say it is. I mean, obviously there's a way that, so the person always has to say yes. They have to say yes. They can't, they can't say no. They can't say no. Um, I think it just happens that about 95% of the time the men say yes without really maybe, I mean, they're wrong. Hopefully they do take a discernment and say, yes, yeah, fine. You know, God's calling me to this. Um, I look at it this way. People always ask me, like, don't you want to become a bishop? Well, no, I don't want to become a bishop. No, that's, no that would be the most horrible thing that ever happened to me. And they said, well, what happens if you do? I said, well, out of obedience. And I would, I would be hard-pressed to say no, because, again, if the Holy Father's asked me, and um, I've been saying yes this whole time, and I would be saying, yeah, but I am praying that I never get asked. <laughs> I think that's something good to pray for. And hope other people are praying for me, too, in that respect, because that's, you know. Um, but I think, that's, I think that's where you kind of go, you start going astray. And I, I, would, I may have just had to say that if I'm ever asked, I would tell you to take a discernment and bring it to prayer and ask God if he wants that for me. But I also just pray that I never have asked. Right? So, yeah. And to stay below the radar. <laughs> yeah, and, and sometimes... It goes on, though, as a priest, you know, you may think about it differently. I don't know. You know? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I think... Let's see. How should I put this? I think sometimes it's generational. I think I think there was a time where men entered the seminary and it entered, you know, became ordained with the thought that, oh yeah, I'm gonna be a bishop someday. It's gonna be great, yeah. right? I think that's true. I think there's some men of our presbyter today that probably still feel that way. And God love them. I mean, they're they're all good men. They're all you know have the right intention. Um, but I think today nowadays that's actually almost a detriment. If you have a guy that's discerning the priesthood and they're doing that because well, I'm gonna be a bishop someday. That's usually a big red flag, mm-hmm. right? Because what, what what ends up happening is, let's say you're not, and then how's that? Well, then what's your life now? How how do you look at your life? Is it now a burden? Is it now is it joyless now because you're not being asked to be a bishop? Uh, and then also sometimes you can even make the argument that those who are looking looking for it probably shouldn't be the ones being asked anyway, right? So it's it's a double edged sword there, and I would say. I would say good, I think in all seriousness, I would say about, at least from my experience with Kenrick, everyone there is there, not to become a bishop, to be a good holy priest. And that's what they're trying to train men to do, mm-hmm. right? Be good holy pastors, and praise God for that. Um, I know if I were a vocation director, and I, I found out that a man was in the, in the seminary because he wouldn't become a bishop, I might have to have a discussion with that man and say, that's not what this is about. You realize that, right? You know, you're being called to serve, and in whatever capacity God calls you to serve. Now, that's not saying you may not become a bishop. Maybe that's a possibility. But how is your life going to look like if you're not? Let's say you're in your 60s, 70s, and the Holy Father is not picking up the phone and calling you to become a bishop. Is your life pointless? Was that a, was that a waste of time then for you? 
Are you not finding joy in your in your in your vocation now? Is that going to affect your priesthood? All legitimate questions. That's something we should be prayed on and looked at. You know. So. I mean, do they really know what the bishop's duties and responsibilities are when they say, <coughs> "You know, I want to be a bishop." Though? Well, I think, well, yeah, I think from an ecclesi ecclesiological and like a, a canonical standpoint, yeah. I mean, you study those things, like what the role of the bishop is in the church and what they're really called to do and um, what their authority is when it comes to these things, right? Um, we study all that. Um, practically speaking, probably not, right? I mean, I, I know just from experience that Archbishop, Archbishop Rosansky's schedule is booked solid probably almost every day, right? His entire calendar on a daily basis is filled. And praise God for it, right? Better him than me. Not that mine isn't. It's just that it's a different thing, right? Yeah. Um, but also, I think a lot of the practical decisions are made. Like, I, I, it always, I always kind of feel... I, I do pray for Archbishop Nancy every day. And especially uh, since he's, he's coming to the Archdiocese with COVID and all this other stuff going on in this Archdiocese... What a way to start your Episcopal. He was a, no, he was a bishop before, but become an archbishop in a major metropolitan, very Catholic area, and you start it with all these this craziness going on in your diocese. How do you navigate that? And part part of the question I guess I had I would have if I was in position was well, who can I trust here, right? Right. I have a curia, and they're 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 supposed to help me and provide for me, but. All people, <laughs> well, they don't know them, and you know, everyone, human nature, we all have an agenda in some way, right? And so maybe our agendas align, maybe they don't, right? And so who can I say, this person really has my best interest at heart, has the best interest of the diocese at heart, and which one of these people are just looking out for themselves or even their people? Again, not necessarily bad, but also, does that really align with our ministry as a church? Um, and you have to do that pretty quickly here. And I think he's done a great job of doing that. Um, I think a lot of the decisions he's made so far have been very, very, prep, uh, I would say, prudent and wise. Um, probably because part of this experience of, of kind of being a, a bishop in a, he would say, a post-Christian world in, in the East Coast where there's really not a lot of Catholicism. It's not really a Catholic culture. Um, I think one thing he's appreciated, I know we've said this before, coming here in St. Louis, is the Catholicity of St. Louis, that you're kind of in a Catholic culture here in the city. Um, in this diocese. So I think he's appreciated that quite a bit. Um, but also, too, I think he realizes, like any pastor or any shepherd, once you make a decision, you're going to have people that agree with you and people don't agree with you. Yeah, that's true. And so there's a lot of landmines you're coming in for the first time, you know, as a, as a new pastor or bishop that you have to really kind of navigate and say, okay, where, where can I move around here? What can I do? What's. Not gonna. What's gonna keep as many people pleased as possible? Um, and where could we? What choice I have to make? They're gonna take some people off, and how do I handle that? I'm not immune to that. I I witnessed that in my not my priesthood, but you know, so far it's nice to be an associate. If I can be associate forever, that'd be great. But I know that's probably <laughs> not gonna happen. Um, it's nice saying, well, that's a great. I'll, I'll, that's a great question. I'll hand that off and, and run up the flagpole and see. There's a great. Piece of that, um, but yeah, I think that's that's something that every bishop has to really kind of handle. And as we start, I think that's that's kind of constant. Uh, Archbishop Carlson, I think, did a masterful job. Um, but I know he, he made some decisions that take some people off too. That's life. Yeah, but primarily speaking, the job of the bishop, though, is the same job as really a pastor. It's just that he has a bigger territory. So his job is his main job is to bring, bring people closer to Christ, mm -hmm. and not, he's responsible for every soul in his diocese, not just the Catholic soul. And I think for that reason alone, I would want to be a bishop, because you know? I don't know, I'm not that holy. <laughs> That's kind of way I look at it. I mean, it's sort of like one of these things where I just I I can do enough with a with a parish. You know, That's gonna be enough for me. You seem like you be perfectly happy, like you say, being associate, being with the parish and not 
administration of the parish. There is a great joy. Yeah, well, there's a great joy in just being a priest. Just being a, you know, ministering the sacraments, being with people in their times of joy and times of sorrow, not having to make decisions that actually impact people one way or another. There is a great freedom in joy in that. And yeah, I think anyone would love doing that. I know my brother priests do too. Everyone I've been ordained with is associated now, and they're loving it just because, yeah, this is awesome. Now, some of us older guys who have actually lived in some other realm other than the priesthood, I think we recognize that once you, you know, there will be a time when you have to make a decision, and based on our prior experiences, because of that, we're going to make people that are going to have anger with us. And people may even not come to church anymore because of that. Now, hopefully, you go to some other church, you know, go to some other Catholic church, hopefully. But that has an impact. And it's unfortunate because I think those decisions and those those discernments, if you want to call them that, are not made in prudence and with asking God what he wants for them. I think oftentimes when people make these decisions, they come down to more political issues. You know, well, you know, I want to be on the I want to be on the pastoral council and I'm not anymore, so well, like I'm going to the Joan of Arc. Or totally destroys your faith. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, right. Like, you know. Yeah. Well, and I think part of that too. I mean, in a way that kind of that kind of also flows into like while the scandals happen in the church. I mean, I, I was making kind of clear that you know you shouldn't put your faith in Father Mark Madden or Monsignor John Shemleff or Monsignor Joe Simon. Because if you do, you're going to be disappointed. Right. If your faith is in Jesus, you can't go wrong. And no matter what I do as a priest or Monsignor Shemleff as a priest, as long as you have that focus, you're going to be fine. Because as we learn from St. Lawrence, a lot of this stuff really doesn't matter too much in the grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. All these practical things that happen in this world, it's a blip on the radar and then it's gone. Mm-hmm. Kind of like our lives. Yeah, but. right. And so I think you have to have a jovial, a good sense of humor about it and not take yourself too seriously. I think if you follow what St. Lawrence did, I think you'd be fine. Now, he, of course, he died. He was killed for what they're the over. But hey. Turn you over. We, 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 <laughs> <on> the side. <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing. We're all called to be, we're all called to lead on our lives completely for Jesus. Right? So, yeah. Good. Any other questions, either online or otherwise? Let's see. All right. Well, we've got a few people watching, that's good. So send your comments or your questions and we'll uh, field them. Otherwise, we can call it night. Kind of really night, but still, that'd be fine. Maybe a few more seconds here if anyone has any questions. They type like I do, it may be a while. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't know. You see, it tells me how many people are viewing, but not, enough, not who's viewing. <laughs> so. That would be kind of nice. I don't know if they could do that. Uh, no, they can't do that. That'd be, that'd be a nice feature. If anyone's watching from Facebook, it'd be awesome if you guys can give like a uh, a function you can tell who's actually watching. That'd be cool. In the meantime, that'd be fine. All right, well, that's it. Um, all right, well, it's going to call it night. A little bit early, but that's cool. Um, okay. So we'll do it again next, next week. So same time, same channel. Back here, hopefully, maybe outside if it's nice. And I was just, I was really discerning that. I thought it was going to be raining or something. So I figured mm-hmm. we'd do it down here. Yeah. Um, but I was, of course, I was told by Eileen. I got to start. I got to check with Eileen from here on out because uh, I think we're having more organizations meet, and we're really limited on meeting space. So hopefully Tuesday should be fine for the most part to use down here. But if not. We're going to plan to do it on the pergola no matter what. Okay. But if there's any, you know, I'll, send it on, I'll send it on the uh, flock note every you know, every Tuesday where we're going to meet. So, so good. Well, in that case, everyone have a great night. Thanks for viewing. And uh, we'll see you guys next week, if okay. not sooner. Thanks.